today is Dr. Sherry Lyons. Sherry has a BA in genetics from Berkeley, an MS in biology from California State University, Los Angeles, and a PhD in the history of science from the University of Chicago, where she specialized in the history of 19th and 20th century biology. She has published three books, and I have them here, and I want to hold them up. A very important book is a biography of Thomas Henry Huxley, which uh, has earned her the sobriquet as the country's greatest expert, if not the world's greatest expert, on Thomas Henry Huxley. <laughs> the second one is a book entitled Species, Serpents, Spirits and Skulls. This is a fascinating book about the intersection between science and imagination in the Victorian era in England. When people, people with scientific credentials believed in things like sea serpents, they believed in uh, seances, and they believed that you could uh, feel a person's head and tell anything about it. <laughs> And the, the last one is one that uh, she has some of them on the table here that uh, she'll let you have a uh, price. You might be able to negotiate, I don't know. Uh, Evolution, the basics. And I found it a very interesting book because it kind of traces the whole idea of evolution from the beginning up to the present. And the convolutions, the different controversies, the different people involved, the different ideas and how we got here today. And I can tell you, there's something interesting to think about in almost every sentence in this book. I recommend it. So please welcome Sherry Lyon. The fact of the matter is, evolution is the great unifying theory for biology. Darwin's <laughs> ideas have had far-reaching applications in diverse fields from biogeography to immunology to neurobiology and even economics. As the great geneticist uh, Theodosius Dobjonsky said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. I don't know how many of you have seen this book. Um, it's now just come out in paperback um, for something like $16. Um, I won't tell you how many copies of The Origin of Species I own, but if you're going to buy one, this is the one to buy. And at the break you can because it's got all kinds of uh, fabulous pictures. Um, it's got reprints of letters from Darwin, uh, from the journal. Um, so there's an incredible amount of material from the 19th century uh, original stuff, plus gorgeous photographs. But it is also the original text. So this is like a bargain, bargain book. So um, to frame my discussion, I want to actually uh, distinguish three distinct aspects of Darwin's theory. First, evolution simply means change. Darwin, as you know, was not the first person to advocate change. Lamarck, Darwin's grandfather, um, and others, such as Etienne uh, St. Hilaire. Um, Darwin not only uh, claimed, though, that species changed into one another, but just that there was this idea of descent with modification and that you got branching and diversification. The second idea, which uh, will become apparent why this is important, was that change was slow, okay, and gradual. So the second idea is gradualism, all right? Now, what was really also unique about Darwin's theory was his mechanism of how species change, which of course was natural selection. Now why is natural selection such an important mechanism? It's because natural selection did not just explain how species change, but how they change adaptively. And remember, this is the key idea that he has to confront uh, with the natural um, theologians, which we're still dealing with today in its latest form, right, of intelligent design. The fact of the matter is, Darwin, a lot of organisms do look designed. And I have to tell you, when I started graduate school and I started reading the natural theology literature myself, 
it's very persuasive. It's very compelling. So this was a very legitimate, not today, even though people are trying to make it that way, this was a very legitimate, important idea in the 19th century. And Darwin himself recognized that. If you can't explain adaptation, then your theory is going to go nowhere. So natural selection explained how organisms could become adapted. Um, so the point, so the other point I want to make is that um, the idea of descent from a common ancestor was quite quickly accepted. Why was that? It's because, as Darwin wrote his botanist friend, American, uh, uh, American botanist Isaac, Isaac Gray, in 1860, he says, quote, Embryology is to me by far the strongest single class of facts in, fa uh, in its favor. But the point is, it is evidence for common descent and ancestry. It is not evidence for natural selection. Evidence from embryology and paleontology suggested that organisms could be grouped into distinct types and that there were no transitional <laughs> organisms between them. So according to Goethe and the natural philosophian or transcendental morphologist, the essence of an organism was this independent ideal or type, while living organisms represented variants and departures from this essence. People thought Huxley, very influenced by our next person, Carl Ernst von Baer, um, thought that the best way to make this distinction was to look at patterns of development. And actually, a little plug for my man Huxley. Huxley um, actually read German. Um, Darwin didn't in that. And he, uh, Huxley actually translated uh, von Baer's work. And so it's really Huxley who made it uh, responsible, uh, made, made it accessible to a lot of uh, people in, uh, in England. Um, Darwin was very impressed with von Baer's ideas by uh, examining the embryonic development of a variety of organisms, von Baer concluded that organisms could be uh, grouped into four major types, mollusks, articulata, radiata, and vertebrates. vertebrates. Von Baer believed these types were distinct, and he did argue against transmutation or evolution. However, he acknowledged that um, a certain amount of change could occur within types, and furthermore, he also acknowledged that all animal forms had undergone some kind of differentiation. Uh, and the further back you trace development, the more similar, widely different animals appeared. He asked, in fact, this was pretty amazing, are not all animals essentially similar at the commencement of their development? Have they not all a common primary form? Unquote. But the other thing that's important to know about Cuvier is that he really demonstrated uh, the abrupt appearance and disappearance of groups in the fossil record. Extinction was real. Where did new organisms come from? Now, several prominent researchers saw parallels between the embryonic development and the fossil record. William Carpenter borrowed von Baer's basic idea of this undifferentiated germ becoming more specialized as development and proceeded, and he applied it to the fossil record. So he, in his book, showed uh, that uh, the fossil record showed a progression from a generalized archetype to a more specialized form. Although people often cite the fossil record in support of evolution, as we will see, the fossil record is, in fact, very problematic. Darwin acknowledged the fossil record, in fact, did not support his theory of slow, gradual change, and that's one of the reasons why he claimed embryology was the strongest evidence in favor of his theory. Descent with modification was relatively quickly um, accepted because it provided the theoretical underpinnings to classification. It told taxonomists why organisms could be arranged in certain ways, but the outlines of that arrangement were well in place pre-origin. I, I am actually now going to be discussing the two, two ideas that were not well accepted, um, initially of Darwin's theory, but this again is going to show you what a rich uh, 
opportunity his theory provided in terms of investigating uh, specific questions. The fossil record demonstrated unequivocally that vast organisms certainly had inherited the Earth at different times in Earth history, but by the same token, it also did not demonstrate that organisms gradually transformed into one another. They kind of abruptly appeared and abruptly disappeared. All right? Um, so that's a problem for, for, for Darwin's theory. So Huxley thought evolution by saltation or jumps seemed to better fit the facts of um, development in the fossil record. So on the eve of the um, publication of The Origin, Huxley writes Darwin, and this is what he says, you have loaded yourself with an unnecessary difficulty in adopting natura non facta saltum so unreservedly, meaning nature does not make jumps. Okay, And as I said, Darwin was certainly well aware of the problem. And this is a quote that is taken from the origin. Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against my theory. And in fact, for those of you, if you haven't read The Origin, um, Darwin devotes two chapters to, the or uh, to geology, and basically his argument comes down to, well, this might not be the best, the fossil record might not be the best evidence for my theory, but at least this is the reason why it's not an argument against my theory, okay? Um, he borrowed an analogy from his good friend Charles Lyell, who said that reading the geology, geological record was like reading a book where most of the pages were missing and only a few words were on each page. In other words, the fossil record was woefully imperfect. Whether an organism was actually preserved or not depended on so many different factors that the fossil record represented a quite incomplete chronicle in the history of life. The origin was published in 1859, and in 1861, guess what was found? Archaeopteryx. Now, Archaeopteryx, it was technically classified as a bird by Richard Owen. Everybody agreed. Uh, so he, technically, this couldn't be considered a connecting link because it's a bird. But it is a bird that has very reptilian type uh, uh, features. Um, and another plug for my man Huxley. Huxley was the first person to suggest that dinosaurs would be the connecting link between birds and reptiles. Some dinosaurs were remarkably bird-like in a variety of ways. For example, the structure of the pe pelvis. Uh, and here is a slide that uh, uh, below shows a generalized bird structure and above a dinosaur, and it's showing uh, the similarity. Uh, this is a great... Uh, a great thing I, I've heard about uh, curators at various natural history museums as kids projects that you can like. They say bring a chicken and we're gonna, uh, a ch you know, bring chicken skeletons and we're gonna turn it into a dinosaur, you know, in, a, uh, uh, in projects and that. So evidence uh, continued to build for this idea throughout the 20th century. Um, um, and then in 1990, feathered dinosaurs were discovered in China. So this is a stunning validation of both Huxley and Darwin's ideas. So um, this is just a slide. These are all the feathered dinosaurs that have been discovered, a uh, poster, and this is an actual fossil of a feathered dinosaur. And the big problem was, how do you really generate novelty? Is natural selection a strong enough mechanism to actually create new species, not just well-marked varieties, all right? So natural selection has a, a tough battle uh, um, for the next, really, until about the 1940s. Um, and one of the things... Um, that is a problem was, of course, natural selection has to act on variation. If you don't have variation, you can't have selection. Briefly, um, what happens is we get uh, the rise of population genetics 
uh, some uh, various people, what they are able to do is that they're able to show with modeling that most traits are, um, have many genes involved in them, and because of that, you can actually push the variation of a population beyond, beyond the variability that was in the parent population. So population genetics kind of brings, uh, helps bring together this idea that natural selection working on tiny little uh, variations can in fact create species change. Now the 1940s gives rise to what Julian Huxley dubbed the modern synthesis, who was considered really the pivotal person was uh, Dobjonsky, who I mentioned. Uh, he wrote this book called Evolution and the Origin of Species in 1937. He was a geneticist that had come from uh, Russia. He brought a populational approach that looked at the genetics of natural populations. And so his work was critical to bridging the gap uh, between the field uh, uh, naturalists who were seeing these little tiny variations and the geneticists who were doing artificial uh, experiments in the lab uh, with mutation, all right? Um, so he really provided experimental evidence that showed the true nature of mutations, showing how small their effects could be, but at the same time how this contributed to the enormous variability that existed in the population. And so he had a very fruitful collaboration with Cyril Wright in 1938, uh, from 1938 on, and they demonstrated that selection was not just a mechanism of change, but actually that it can also maintain stability through a variety of mechanisms. That, that mass extinctions might have played a more major role in shaping what life looks like today than natural selection. The dinosaurs were doing just fine until a meteorite crashed into the ocean. Uh, the basic process of natural selection adapts organisms to the environment. But if a catastrophic change occurs, it might not matter how well an organism is adapted. You know, you might be the best little fish in the pond and you've got really streamlined fins and you're just zooming around, but if the pond dries up, where are you? You're extinct, that's where you are. But some little grubby fish that kind of had stubby fins and maybe had a bladder that could, was fish bladder that was capable of taking some oxygen, maybe that little creepy guy that was barely hanging on was able to somehow survive in the mud, maybe crawl his way off to a new pond, and there you have it, a whole new round of evolution starting. Okay, so remember, mammals already existed. Uh, they coexisted with dinosaurs. They were just tiny little rodents and stuff, and they might have stayed that way for many, many more hundreds of millions of years. But in fact, this meteorite came down, and for some reason, uh, I mean, the dinosaurs went extinct. This opened up a whole new niche. The mammals kind of rose to promise, prominence, and eventually, guess who emerged? Us, Homo sapiens. <laughs> So we've got segmentation in flies and segmentation in vertebrates. So it, it looks, it's the same thing, segmentation of body parts, and this was always considered analogy, all right? It arose independently, separate genetic control. Well, I mean, after all, flies are in, and flies and vertebrates are separated by something like 500 million years of evolutionary history. That's how far back you have to go to find a common ancestor. Well, guess what? These homeobox genes have been conserved. It's the same genes. I mean, you know, everybody talks about, you always are hearing thrown around, oh, we share like 99% of our genes with, you know, chimps. Well, guess what? We share about like 60% of our genes with fruit flies. So, you know, evolution, everybody thinks, talks about evolution as change, as change. But this is really showing us that evolution is actually a very conservative process. It conserves and rearranges and tinkers. And that's what's so exciting about this field, evolutionary developmental biology. So again, the same genes are being found in insects, in earthworms, in frogs, in mice, and even in humans. 
The Hochsteins and mice were arranged and clustered just as they were in the fly. And the order corresponded to the order of the body regions in the mouse in which they were expressed, just as they were in the flies. <coughs> but this is a, another gene. It's called um, the Pax 6 gene. So again, eyes. We have eye, diff vastly different kinds of eye structures in different organisms, squids, all the way back to, uh, you know, maybe just a, a, a light, a pigment that's in the cell on the skin of a frog or, so, or something, of an invertebrate, not a frog that can sense light. Well, it turns out this Pax6 gene is conserved all the way from that this primitive invertebrate up through cephalopod eyes to our human eyes. Even though the eyes look very, very different, this gene has been conserved. We're going on to zebras now. <laughs> How did the zebra get its stripes, okay? Uh, well, and why does the zebra have stripes? Okay, there are a variety of theories out there. Uh, and um, these include that it might confuse predators, a uh, whole big large group of them uh, might look like one organism. Um, some studies have said that stripes uh, help them regulate their temperature. Um, um, some have suggested each pattern is unique, uh, so maybe recognition, does, a ze does one zebra recognize another zebra from its stripe pattern? We don't really know. Um, Here's an example of uh, another suggestion of camouflage. Okay, this is a mother and uh, its baby. Um, there's another uh, interesting theory that um, it's evolved uh, that uh, uh, to um, uh, flies like horse flies and uh, the tsetse fly uh, like uh, dark moving objects, and so by having a striping pattern uh, that this, um, um, that this uh, keeps them away. And, and there have been some uh, interesting experiments that have done, that have shown that, that uh, the stripes uh, with sort of fake zebras and that, models of zebras, all right? So we don't really know what, what the answer is about that. But what we have uh, known is that zebra embryos very um, early on in development are black, are actually black, and they develop their white stripes later on. And depending on what time in development um, determines, uh, um, determines uh, what the striping pattern is. Um, so this was uh, the work of a man named Jonathan Bard, and um, he says that the striping pattern initially starts out the same, and what differs is the time at which the stripes were generated. Um, and, and this is what um, this embryo, uh, this slide is showing. But then I want to move on um, to um, the next one, although th this is an old photograph. It's not, it's not a great photograph, but I'm, in terms of, I'm going to just tell you what the previous shot was showing and then what the end result is, okay? So, if, if the stripes start getting generated during week three, the stripes begin perpendicular to the anterior-posterior body axis, but become parallel to the axis in the rump, since the rear of the zebra is still growing. This generates the pattern of the common zebra, which is C, um, the one in the bottom left, okay? Um, if the striping pattern is generated on week four, most of the rump has grown, and the pattern is seen in the mountain zebra, which is B, the one on the top right. If the striping pattern is generated on week five, there is space for many more stripes, all of which are perpendicular to the body axis, and that's the striping pattern of the imperial zebra, which is A. And this last one is a... Uh, I know, quagga, which is uh, extinct now. Again, to go back to the beginning, ever since Darwin, this persistent question, does natural selection really have the ability to create new species? Can it create rather than well-marked varieties? How does it create um, novelty? 
And uh, I think the astounding findings in the last uh, 30 years have shown us that the creation of new forms is possible because of a few key concepts. First, evolution works by tinkering with what is already present. We're seeing these genes have been conserved over hundreds of millions of years, all right? Wings did not spring de novo from a four-legged vertebrate. Second, structures can have a variety of functions, all right? In vertebrates, wing structures were probably not originally used for flying, but for thermoregulation. So multifunctionality extends to the level of the gene with the same old gene being used in many different ways, and I, we've given you some examples of that. The third idea is redundancy. Simply duplicating a particular structure can generate very many different forms. And also, the idea, if you have the same form repeated and repeated and repeated, it then means that, well, maybe it doesn't have to do the same thing. You know, you've got the, you can start specializing and have one segment do something else, okay? Um, so you get a kind of division of labor uh, that results in a, both uh, a new organ both in structure and function. It's like if you've only got one segment, well, that segment has to do one thing. But if you've got it repeated a hundred times, maybe it can go start looking like something else and do something else. Um, just the whole idea of the rise of multicellularity. So gene duplication has been a very important source of innovation, making it possible for the same gene to be used in many, many different ways. And finally, modularity has been crucial to the creation of an enormous amount of diversity. And the example I was giving you was this about the ground plan of the butterfly, a few basic elements, and they, we, the butterflies have been able to uh, generate literally thousands and thousands and thousands of different species, right? Uh, with different patterns. So through duplicating, mixing, and modification of various parts, and then again, arthropods, just that whole category, have evolved different structures with different functions from the same basic unit. And that has led to the most diverse group of animals on Earth. Um, another example, which I haven't talked about, but the modular nature of digits made possible the evolution of a long fourth finger in uh, uh, pet uh, petrosaurs and many long fingers on bats, which then uh, paved the way for getting a membrane to fly. So, in terms of going back to the title of this course, Darwin indeed has left us with a very rich legacy. It is ironic that embryology was eclipsed with the rise of population genetics because it was always central to Darwin's thinking. Many questions were essentially ignored that are now only beginning to be addressed. And I think the complete unification of evolution with development is, of course, it's a work in progress right now that is being approached on many different fronts. For any kind of evolution to occur, there must be variation within populations. But relatively little research has specifically examined the role of variation in development. So here's my ending slide, going back to Huxley and again about the, the butterflies. There is no field of biological inquiry in which the influence of the origin of species is not traceable and that is the embodiment of a hypothesis. It is destined to guide, uh, to be the guide of biological and psychological speculations for the next three or four generations. And I think that's very true. Okay, thanks.